All your poems are about love, though. How did you get to that level of compassion if you were self-described as an aggressive person then? It's funny. I mean, I, I, there's totally two sides of me. Like I said, I, I, I held that part of me back for so long. I buried it down and didn't really show people that it's even still hard for me to post some lovey-dovey poems. But I think since I started writing them for my girlfriend, that's what just came out. It was a way for me, to, especially early on in our relationship, to show her that I did care or or the, how much I cared or the way I cared that I couldn't express it with words to tell her, if that makes sense. And I think if even if it's uh, metaphorically or an analogy or through imagery, whatever that I'm expressing in the poem, it's something that I felt or I still feel is hard to say looking someone in the eye or face to face, which I think, especially in these times where it's, it's more rare, a handwritten letter or a note or poem to someone is very personal and kind of shows them that you, you actually care, you know? I am Ryan Peverly, and you are listening to Oculture, broadcasting esoteric art, science, and history, recorded at 528 hertz, the frequency of love, appropriate on this Valentine's Day, because this transmission is most definitely for the lovers out there. Our guest this time around is poet Brian Abbott, also known around the interwebs as High Poets Society. Brian and I are going to be chatting about love, cannabis, and poetry. But first, you're listening to the song Frequencies by my homeboy VHS Dreams. Hit that link in the show notes to stream it for free on SoundCloud right now. Did I just did I just say homeboy? Do people still say that? Maybe I should have cut that out. Either way, go stream this track. I don't know why, but it hits me right in the feel spot. The feel spot that's like stuck in late 80s rave culture, even though I wasn't part of late 80s rave culture, but I imagine this is how it felt. Anyway, let's light this transmission up. Brian Abbott is in the house. He's recently published his first book of poetry titled High Poets Society. That's also his social media handle on Instagram and Facebook, uh, and Tumblr too, I believe. Brian is what you would call insta-famous. I actually don't know if that's a thing, but he's got a couple hundred thousand Instagram followers and he's built his following up from just sharing simple poems about love and relationships. But they were good enough to not only land him a book deal with a small indie publisher, but also some shelf placement in Barnes & Noble bookstores across the U.S. And the cool thing about this is Brian's just a regular dude trying to forge his own path in this life. A self-made man, if you will. And I admire that. We should all strive towards such a goal. Now, this is a bit of a different chat, but it's one I'd like to have more of on this show. And it's one that I enjoyed immensely. We did have some interesting interference during the first half of the call that I just couldn't edit out of the audio. Honestly, it sounded like the line was tapped, but I'm trying not to be paranoid. Anyway, without further rambling, let's do this damn thing. Here's my conversation with Brian Abbott. Enjoy. Enjoy. Brian Abbott, hey dude, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, man, absolutely, thanks for having me. No problem, man. So you are at High Poets Society on Instagram, Facebook, it's your website too, Um, highpoetssociety.com. You know, I haven't talked to a poet before. Tell me a little bit about how you got into this rather, I I don't want to say it's a lost art, but it seems like it is. But tell me how you got into poetry. Yeah, I mean, I've always kind of... I've always been a reader, I guess. I've always liked to read different things. I mean, poetry is definitely something that I've always been interested in. Um, I probably started writing poetry myself, I think, about 12 years ago, I would say. I think I was a freshman in college. I was sitting in the library. It was probably around Christmas time. I don't know what I was doing, homework, studying for finals or midterms, whatever it was at the time. 
and um, I was actually reading a book of poetry by Tupac, actually. And, I mean, as someone I always grew up listening to, I mean, I think people my age, at least, he's someone, even kids nowadays love Tupac, you know? I mean, he's someone that's timeless, I think, at this point. He wrote a bunch of poetry to this girl while he, I think he was in jail. And uh, after he died, the girl published it. She wrote kind of like their story. They kind of had love letters back and forth. It was kind of like a budding friendship, relationship. It was kind of what I was going through with a girl that I kind of met at that time. And um, I thought, hey, I could do this. And I actually wrote her a poem. And I gave it to her. And um, that relationship didn't last too long. I actually started dating my girlfriend currently right after that. We've been together for uh, 11 years now. Until I started Instagram about two years ago, I, the only people that even knew I wrote anything were really those two girls. I mean, I kind of, I, I don't know, I kind of just kept it to myself. Like it, was, it was something I did for, like, Valentine's Day or a birthday. I, I've never really been, like, a card buyer. You know, I, I, don't, I hate going into, like, the drugstore and uh, standing in the card aisle and looking at all the cards. I hate it, you know? So I kind of always made something, I mean... It, it wasn't even necessarily nice, you know. I just jotted down on some notebook paper or whatever and fold it up and put their name on it and give it to them. And most of my girlfriend are now. I guess everyone who read it before was always thought it was good, which, I don't know, I kind of felt like they had to say it, you know. I mean, yeah. if, it's, if it's your significant other giving you something that they're pouring their heart out for and you just trash it, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's, People don't do that. So I kind of, I, it wasn't something that I really believed in 100%, you know? You told me uh, a story before we started talking about a uh, professor reading a poem out loud in your class and nobody... Yeah, I think... Yeah, sorry, was, uh, yeah. go ahead. I think it was a creative writing class. I mean, this was probably a couple years later, probably my junior or senior year of college. And uh, we had to write either like a short story or prose or poem or something. I don't know what the what it was, but I ended up writing a poem. And uh, he was like, wow, this is really good. Like, do you mind, would you get up in front of the class and read it? And I was like, oh, like, no way. Like, I was I, not so much embarrassed, but more so like, I think I was saying to you before, like, I have that like, the tough guy persona, you know what I mean? Like, I don't oh, yeah. really yeah. want that, the soft side to be seen, you know, as a... Uh, <laughs> He um, and then was like, okay, well, do you mind if I read it to the class? And I was like, yeah, go for it. I mean, if you really think so, like, go for it. So he ended up reading it to the class, and I think um, there was a girl I was friends with that like sat behind me or next to me or something, and she was like, did you really write that? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. like I mean, she was like, I would have never guessed that like you even have that side. You know, so I kind of I buried it down for a long time. And I mean, I started writing when I would think, like I said, when I was about 18, I'm 30 now. I started Instagram two years ago. So until then, I didn't. And even so, I kind of, the moniker of High Poet Society was kind of my way of hiding a little bit, you know? Yeah. I didn't want to put my name. I didn't want to put my face right at first. I never, I didn't even like really tell people around me. I don't even think I told my girlfriend until I got maybe like a thousand followers. And I was like, damn, maybe, maybe this is catching on or people actually think it's good or like it you know right right so i'm glad that you mentioned tupac up front here because we talked once before a few days ago and we just kind of introduced ourselves to each other and whatnot but <laughs> this didn't come up i'm a huge tupac fan huge oh yeah yeah so i always say there would be no high poet society if it wasn't for uh tupac more more so the uh, All Eyes on Me CD. <laughs> I think that like changed my life when I was probably about 11 or 12 years old. Yeah, and, you know, uh, that was uh, that was a double album, 1995. Double and, album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My grandparents used to have a beach house, and I would be down there all summer long, and I don't think I came out of that cottage. I put it in my little boombox, my little CD player, and I would crank that up loud and listen to it over and over and over again. I think it kind of, I mean, Tupac's lyrics, at least, are so poetic. And, I mean, he writes poetry, like I said. What really got me started was that, that book that that lady published called uh, Inside a Thug's Heart. And, yeah, I mean, it, it was just handwritten notes that he wrote from jail to this girl. It was just poems and, and him 
spitting his game to it, really. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, he's he's just been a huge influence. I think I actually, even, it's in the biography of the, my, my book, I uh, mentioned that. Because it's it's huge. It's, I mean, if it wasn't if it wasn't for him, I, there would wouldn't be beside me. I, I think you know. And I mean, he's thug life. He's no. There's no more manly thing than really than Tupac. So for him to have the side of him, this emotional side or whatever, it's it kind of gave me a, a okay. I feel like you know. Well, do you remember the first time you heard the song "Dear Mama"? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I was probably around that same time because I mean that like I said that. Uh, all Eyes on Me CD opened up to, I mean, he already had four or five other CDs out before that, I think. Yeah, that song, that's a, like I said, timeless song that's going to go down forever. You know, you're talking about opening up the emotional side from a from a persona that didn't seem like he had one, at least on the surface, you know, because he was that, you know, thug life, West Coast till I die, you know, like all that stuff, but... You hear a song like Dear Mom and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this? Yeah, I mean, he he definitely had that... He always said, I never had a record until I had a record, you know? I mean, he went to, like, theatrical school and high school and stuff and did, like, the ballets and stuff, you know? He was he, he was a performer more so than anything, and uh, he found himself in the gangster rap of the 90s and, and changed a whole generation, I think, and I was totally, totally part of that. Yeah, I definitely owe it to him a little bit, or a lot of it, I think. I majored in creative writing in college and I took a poetry class one semester and had never really written poetry, never really been a big fan of poetry in terms of like reading it, especially at that age. I was, you know, I don't think a lot of young kids get into poetry, right? But yeah. So when I had to write poetry for this class, I'm listening to hip hop or just music in general and I start to write like songs almost, not not poems necessarily, but I I had constructed my my poems for the class like music almost, and I don't know why. Did you ever find yourself doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always say like what I like most about music or musicians more so than the actual music are the lyrics. Like I always I, my some of my favorite songs are because of what the lyrics say, not so much what the beat is or the tune or the melody i'm not really mechanically uh musically inclined like that you know i don't i i i hear the words and i think kind of when i'm writing a lot of times that i get inspired are from like a specific word that i hear or see or something and i feel like it, it i immediately like think of a rhyme like just subconsciously i think and i think a lot of that has to do with I mean, especially hip hop, like a lot of the songs rhyme and it's it just how it is, you know, like it just, it's, it's smooth and it flows that way. You know, I think my mind just subconsciously, like I says, I, I, I immediately think of it. And one thing I did do when I started Instagram, which I didn't really do before. And I think this was just to kind of keep up and be able to keep posting new stuff and keep, um, keep it keep it fresh you know is that anytime I had an idea or I uh, thought of something I would write it down and um, I would go back and I might rewrite it or I might add to it I might take away from it and I might not post it for a year you know but it's always sitting there as at least an idea and like I think like people ask me all the time like will DM me or comment like what like advice can I give people and that's one thing I always tell people like write everything down like don't say no to an idea because you don't know what it might spark later on. You don't know what it might turn into. And I think I'm my biggest critic. And it's funny to me which pieces I've uh, posted that I think are awesome that don't get so much love and pieces I think are mediocre or whatever get a ton of love. Do you ever use um, one of the biggest tools for me? Do you ever use Evernote? Oh, yeah, yeah. I have the app on my phone and my tablet. I mean, that thing, uh, that, I started out, I think, using it, taking notes, and never really thought of it as, like, uh, something to keep my stuff organized, and, I mean, since Instagram, I mean, I now have, I think in my Evernote folder, I'm about to hit 2,500 poems, Wow. so, I mean, there's no way I can keep track of them all without something like that, and that is just something I ended up using, and I, I ended up loving it, and I've actually, like, connected with them on Instagram and stuff. Um, and talk to like their social media director, which she's awesome. Uh, they've actually like posted me on their on their Facebook and Instagram and stuff because they just they love that I love their app and they love seeing which different creative ways people use it. You know, 
Well, that's funny because Evernote is the sponsor for this episode, so thanks for name-dropping them. <laughs> I am not getting paid by them, <laughs> but it would be nice, so right, Evernote's right. listening. So tell me where the moniker High Poets Society came from. So, well, I guess, all right, fun fact, when I originally started Instagram, um, and you'll even see it still in my email from my website, um, it's Thoughts of the Brain. Um, and that's what my Instagram was originally, maybe for the first week or two. And um, I always loved the movie Dead Poet Society. I saw people using the hashtag, like different writers and stuff, using hashtag like uh, Drunk Poet Society. And I'm not so much a drinker. I'm more of, I guess, I call myself a stoner. And uh, I came up with the High Poet Society, just kind of a play on those two things. And, uh, I mean, I looked it up online. I didn't see anyone else using it anywhere. And I was like, how is it? Like, that's so perfect. Like, how is it anyone using this? <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I, I went with it. So you're a stoner. You're a cannabis user, obviously, then. When were you introduced to cannabis, and how did it change your perspective of things like love and relationships? I was young. I mean, I was, uh, I think I was, uh, I guess, a bad kid. <laughs> we can go for it, we can say. <laughs> and uh, I was, I think, um, the summer going into ninth grade. I think I was probably about, like, 13-ish. Maybe summer going into eighth grade, somewhere around then. But I didn't really start using it every day, or I wouldn't consider myself a stoner back then. Um, I kind of just do it at parties on the weekends or something. I never really bought it myself or whatever, you know, just a friend's had it or something. But I would say probably about my senior year. But I was always scared to uh, kind of, like, I think I was telling you this before, kind of like scared to smoke before school or work or doing homework or anything like that. Like I was always like thought it would hinder me. And I think I was my, a freshman in college and I think I, whatever, got out of work, got high and fucking, I don't know if I can swear. I'm sorry. You can edit that out. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Man. Yeah, good. <laughs> sorry. It just comes out sometimes. <laughs> and I, um, I forgot that I had like a paper due or homework or discussion, question, answer or something. And I just was like, all right, whatever, this already happened. So I got to do this. And uh, and I wrote it and I ended up getting like an A or 100 or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, maybe it kind of boosts my creativity a little bit. You know, kind of I think expands the the places that you go in your mind a little. And I definitely, I mean, I, I write all the time. Um, I write when I... I, sometimes I wake up while I'm sleeping in the middle of the night and I'll write something down and I'll go back to sleep, you know. So it's not always one of them stone, but, I mean, it's a good majority. Once I once, I always say, once I get out of work, it's, uh, it's like 5.30 comes, and once it t- touches my lips, it's downhill from there. <laughs> but, hey, there's a time and a place for everything, I always say. So uh, I think anything you do with uh, with that in mind, you're, you're all right. It's soul kind of cleansing I think for me and um it definitely definitely lets you connect and and stay young at heart I think um right. I mean I think also too the cannabis community at heart is very young um I think a lot of people I think it's changing more so nowadays but if you were 30 and you had kids and you're married and you're a soccer mom and you want to smoke weed then all your friends look down on you for you know Nowadays in Massachusetts, we just legalized it, and I, I think the, those stereotypes and those those views are kind of disappearing, especially with people our age, where we realize it's really not something that's harmful. I mean, obviously, smoking anything, that's obviously bad for you, but there's plenty of ways nowadays. We live in 2017. There's, there's plenty of ways to consume it now that are a lot safer and, I think, beneficial in some ways. Yeah. Do you see this movement to legalize it across the country? Do you see that as a sign of a greater overall movement of things like love and compassion and empathy? Yeah, I mean, I think the legalization of cannabis is like the next kind of social movement that's kind of being bigger and stoners are being accepted and you realize it can be your doctor, your lawyer, your postman, your librarian. It can be anybody, you know. And it's not just the stoner kids dropouts that are kicking hacky sacks and, you, you know, you, you get the picture, you know? Yes. Um, and as it's getting legal or legalizing in more states, I think Maine just legalized in like the eighth state, maybe, I think, to uh, to legalize it. So, I mean, 42 more to go. 
I think Massachusetts has always been on the forefront of social issues. So, yeah, I, I, I could have seen this coming years and years ago that we were going to finally uh, legalize it. And it's just something that I think it's becoming accepted. It's not a hard drug. It's not, I mean, it's not even as bad for you as, say, alcohol. You know, and right. I know there's, there's you don't want to adding another people say uh, adding like another intoxicant to the to the society is not going to be helpful. But I think weed is completely different. And I think once it is legal, they can even get into the where they can do studies and medical trials um, that are actually FDA and um, sponsored by the government and stuff where we can actually figure out the different uh, ailments that it can help with. Uh, my girlfriend has Crohn's disease. Uh, she's been in remission for 13 years now, thank God. But if it ever came back or she ever got a flare-up or anything, she and she's not a cannabis user at all. In the 12 years I've known her, she's never used it once. I think she tried it a couple times in high school, but that's about it. I think I would take her to one of those weed doctors to get her prescription right away to start the oil because, I mean, that's one of the biggest uh, diseases that it helps with. It's an autoimmune yeah. disease, and that cannabis helps with uh, autoimmune diseases, MS, and different different things like that, where I think it's just a godsend for some people that would never be able to live a normal life without it. I think there's, I mean, the more you see it on TV, too, nowadays. Um, a couple of years ago, I think CNN started with those, uh, I think it was Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Sanjay did uh, some documentaries called, like, Weed, The Miracle Cure, or something like that. It was like about little girls having seizures and how it helps people. And I think that kind of started opening up people to this is like society's acceptance this um, as an actual medical, something that's beneficial. And I mean, there's always critics. There's always the opposite side. But without trials and without studies, we won't, we won't know that stuff. Um, so hopefully we're, and it looks like we are going in that direction. I hope. I hope someday it can help a lot of people that maybe wouldn't try it because of stereotypes or old-fashioned views or something that they think it's the same thing as heroin, uh, you know? Well, the and DEA yeah, think, thinks it's the same thing as heroin, yeah. I second your idea about getting your girl on the oil for Crohn's because I've I've heard several stories of people with Crohn's disease taking cannabis oil and, you know, dramatically improving their condition. And I mean, in those oils too, I mean, a lot of people don't realize is that it's not uh, the stuff that's helping people with tumors, with um, autoimmune disease and stuff. It's the CBD oil. It's not even the THC oil that people use to get stoned. The CBD is what's really the medical world is kind of looking at or going after the, the like the Rick Simpson oils and stuff um, of the world that are actually right. helping people. I actually have some CBD oil on my counter right now. I've been taking it for about probably two or three months. I don't have any yeah, conditions. I, yeah, I'm I'm just using it to to use it proactively. So. Yeah, yeah, proactively. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it can't hurt. I mean, it helps with so many um, with your immune system and so many different things that I, yeah, it it, it 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 there's nothing in it that's gonna hurt you really. So it's definitely something. It's like taking a vitamin or a multivitamin, you know. Totally believe in and wholeheartedly and put my faith in completely. If it was ever someone I loved that I, uh, I think could benefit from it. I would second that as well. So the second part of that question that I, I really want to get into is how have you seen cannabis affect your perspective on love and relationships? Because I've I've talked to several people who are regular cannabis users and they point to that plant as something that has kind of accelerated a quote unquote spiritual awakening of sorts or has made them feel more connected to people in their lives. Have you had similar experiences? I mean, I definitely understand that. I can't pinpoint one thing, but I'm definitely kind of more of like an aggressive person or not so much in your face, but you get what I mean. Um, and sure. I think weed kind of lets me relax or calm down and be more aware of what other people are thinking or feeling or saying and not be about myself, I guess, you know, it definitely makes me more show, definitely show more empathy towards people that just helps you connect with people on a different level. Um, if they actually see that you're, you show emotion, you care, and you're interested, you know. And I think if I, uh, I I smoke a little bit and I have a conversation with my girlfriend, I think she definitely thinks I'm more in tune. Well, all your poems are about love, though. How did you get to that level of compassion if you were self-described as an aggressive person then? It's funny. I mean, I, I, there's 
totally two sides of me. And like I said, I, I, I held that part of me back for so long or hid it or, or buried it down and didn't really show people that it's even still hard for me to post some lovey-dovey poems. But I think since I started writing them for my girlfriend, that's what just came out. It was a way for me, to, especially early on in our relationship, to show her that I did care or or the, how much I cared or the way I cared that I couldn't express it with words to tell her, if that makes sense. And I think if even if it's uh, metaphorically or an analogy or through imagery, whatever that I'm expressing in the poem, it's something that I felt or I still feel is hard to say looking someone in the eye or face to face which I think, especially in these times where it's it's more rare, a handwritten letter or a note or poem to someone is very personal and kind of shows them that you you actually care, you know? And that that's kind of how I, I originally used that before Instagram, before any anyone else knew. But yeah, I, I, um, I still use it that way. My girlfriend still expects a, a handwritten poem every Valentine's Day, birthday, Christmas, anniversary, whatever, whatever it have you. My uh, friend, actually, Ironward, if you know him also on Instagram, uh, he sent me a typewriter for my birthday, my first typewriter, uh, since I was probably eight years old and got a word processor or something, you know. So I've been actually typing up some poems and stuff for her, which I think actually kind of, it's a cool look to them at least, you know. Yeah, for sure, man. So, you know, you've been talking about Instagram and you have more than 200,000 followers on there. That's absurd to me, but... (laughs) <laughs> I have like 170, so <laughs> whatever. But what I'm curious about is is there's a large contingent of Instagram users that are really into this love and spirituality and, and poetry. And there's your account and there's accounts of other poets like you that I call them in my head Insta poets because uh, yeah. Uh, they yeah. they get yeah. they just amass this this following and you know 50,000 100,000 just this absurd amount of followers and all they're doing is posting short little poems about love and and relationships and and compassion and peace and harmony and balance and things like that and and I think it's great I follow several accounts you know yours included but what do you make of this movement across social media for this sort of content oh, it's crazy that community that uh, that exists on these Instagrams Tumblr Facebook Twitter, because uh, it's not just Instagram. There's plenty of people that have a couple hundred thousand followers on Facebook and a couple thousand on Instagram, or vice versa. You know, and I had no idea this world existed, and I honestly don't remember what prompted me or whose page or what I saw that prompted me to post on Instagram the first time. I kind of think it was more of, "Wow, there's other people doing this," and I kind of felt, at least for my page is a little bit unique in the fact that like uh, most of my poems do rhyme. I kind of thought that that's the way most people wrote. And once I got on Instagram, I realized that that it kind of made me stand out, I think, a little bit. Because I kind of do have that nursery rhyme, Dr. Seuss kind of rhyme scheme. That's just how my brain works. I don't know. I can't explain it. That's just how it comes out. Even when I try to not write in rhyme, I write in rhyme. It's a great outlet, too. I mean, you see some of the top-selling poetry books out right now are people who started publishing at work on Instagram or Tumblr or Facebook or Twitter or something. Some of the, uh, like, Rupi and R.M. Drake, um, they're selling hundreds of thousands of copies of their books. Um, and they have, um, um, R.M. Drake has a million and something followers, and Rupi's got close to a million. And, I mean, that's just insane how big this, which in the in the publishing world, poetry is such a small, minute, I think kind of even looked past art. I mean, you go into, go into any bookstore, you find the poetry section, see how big it is. It's one bookshelf, maybe, where a, 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 a history of cookbooks will be three aisles. <laughs> so poetry is definitely, like I think you said in, at the beginning, a, a dying or a lost art, which social media is kind of i think rejuvenating it yeah it makes sense too because on social media the more concise you are the better the shorter the the character count the better so it just makes sense that you know short kind of snappy and and catchy poems would be would serve well on social media yeah absolutely and i mean i also think the demographics that 
are on social media are kind of perfect also for the poetry market too, you know? I mean, I think um, now that Instagram on the business pages, you get the insights and stuff. You have, you can see like your, your male and female cow in ages and different cities. And I think I have 78% women and I think 80% of those are like between 17 and 35 or something. So, I mean, I know exactly what my uh, demographics are. And I mean, that's, the majority of poetry readers in general on and off of social media. I think a lot of guys struggle to admit that they would like to read poetry or write poetry or something like kind of like what I was saying before about the being a tough guy, being the alpha male, you know, and poetry doesn't fit in that. And it's uh, rare for a guy to, like I said, like Tupac, to be able to show both sides of that. Uh, no one would call Tupac a pussy, you know? <laughs> right. And he has plenty of poetry books. And if you read some of his poetry in his, you read that poetry book um, that I said that between that girl and it's lovey dovey bullshit that he's writing to this girl to get in her pants really, you know, Yeah. that was something I, uh, at first I was drawn to, like I said, I was going through the same thing with a girl at the time. And I was like, I, I think I can do this. And uh, I think I've actually posted my very first poem on Instagram before. And it's, it's just four lines. Um, and it's short and sweet, and uh, yeah, it's gotten plenty of love. But who knew 12 years ago when I wrote it, sitting in that library at, at school, that um, I would show it to 200,000 people one day, you know? I would have never, you couldn't have paid me a thousand bucks back then as a broke college student to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You mentioned uh, poetry books, you know, aren't a hot ticket among publishers these days, but... You have just put out your first book with Monarch Publishing, right? Yeah, they're a, um, a small a, a small press out in uh, Los Angeles. I actually got connected with them on Instagram. I'm one of their founders and owners. We were talking back and forth for a couple months, just shooting ideas. Um, they weren't really started yet. He uh, kind of had the idea in mind, and he was like, hey, if you put a manuscript together, we have everything in place now, we're ready. If you want to be serious about this, put a manuscript together, and we'll publish it. So I, uh, I flew out to L.A. with my girlfriend for her uh, 30th birthday last year. Um, and at that time, they were out, that was right around the time I was signing a contract, so I met with them, we had lunch, and yeah, it was awesome. So I ended up signing with them. Um, in the, that was in June, the beginning of June. I have the manuscript done by the end of the month. Um, like I said, I have so many poems in my Evernote. I mean, I got 2,500 I'm about to hit now. So it wasn't so much writing the manuscript. It was more so putting it together, forming different chapters, how many, what poems I think flow with what kind of, what theme of that, of that chapter, at least. I put that together and it came out July 25th came out on uh, Amazon and on um, monarchbookstore.com, their website, to purchase. And then um, I think in September we actually got a call from uh, our email they did from uh, Barnes & Noble to put in an order for in-store placement. So that was also something I never even thought or dreamed would have happened. Um, and it was, it's was it been in store since right before uh, Thanksgiving. That's uh, fantastic, man. Congratulations. Thank you. I was like a, a giddy schoolboy. Me and my girlfriend jumped in the car and drove to the closest Barnes & Noble, and it wasn't even on the shelves yet the first night. And uh, the girl, I had to ask, and the girl like looked at me, and we were like, yeah, sure. I think I unpacked that like earlier today. I think it's in the back. I'll go get it. And uh, when she came back with it, my girlfriend was like, it's his book. And the girl was so excited for me. So, I mean, it made me happy. Wait, um, did you buy your own book? a bunch of no, I just took a bunch of pictures with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I took a bunch of pictures with it on the shelf and sent it to my mom and stuff. <laughs> what kind of poems are in the book? What can they expect if they go out and get this from their local Barnes & Noble? So like you were saying before, a lot of my contents kind of love poetry, kind of relationship. Um, the ups and downs, there's definitely a lot of heartbreak in there. It's kind of the same stuff you'll find on my Instagram, but there's plenty of poems in there that I'll never show online anywhere. Um, I kind of want to keep those in the book. That's kind of more of a special meaning for me. So, yeah, if you go there, you'll find more of not the same stuff, but similar stuff and um, a lot more deeper pieces for me, a lot more pieces that I think are uh, closer to heart, maybe some darker pieces I wouldn't be so comfortable sharing with on uh, social media or online. And, yeah, you'll be able to kind of dive into my life ahead 
or love and heartache a little bit more. Do you find it easier to write based off a broken heart? Does that question make sense? Absolutely. I think I think it's definitely very inspirational for a lot of people, especially writers, especially poets. I haven't really, I guess, been heartbroken so much in my life. Um, like I said, me and my girlfriend have been together for 11 years now, so we've had it really good. We've, we're a really good fit. So I think a lot of my stuff, too, is inspired by words that I see or hear. I think I'm a, a good empath that I... I feel what other people feel that and I'm able to express it in a way that maybe we didn't you couldn't say it but you were thinking it if that makes sense yeah definitely tell me then since you started writing poetry what have you learned that you didn't know before about love and relationships through your writing so one thing I think definitely is that when I write something and post it. It may mean something to me. That when I share it with people, especially so many people, and so many people comment, that everyone interprets it differently. I think that's kind of cool that, like, people see something in my writing that I didn't see, and that they, it means something to them that I might not have intended, but they still saw it. They read between the lines, and that's, they, that's what they're meaning, and they got that. Something I try to always tell myself is when I'm when I'm writing is continuity and ambiguity. Like I, I like to make sure the, the poem flows and also can be related to in a way that I didn't expect it to. So it's something I definitely learned through the comments and through people sending me DMs and hey, this was me and my girlfriend or me and my boyfriend or we love you this, but for this situation that I would have never thought it applied to. And I, I think that's cool that people see that, that I, that I might not necessarily see. Has your writing then, has that changed your interpretation of what love is? Yeah, definitely. I, I, it's definitely broadened it. Definitely means different things. Some things that I would write for my girlfriend or I have in a, a loving spousal way someone may read and take it for their son or daughter or kid, you know? And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a, they're taking it in a maternal, a paternal way where I didn't intend that way, and it makes sense. That love comes in all shapes and sizes, you know, and it doesn't have to be confined to what I think, and that there's different kinds of love out there, and there's some, you feel, there's plenty of people, not just your significant other, that you are, you feel deep love for. And I think people look for that in poetry. And I think that's universal since poetry has been written. That's something that uh, all poets kind of strive to convey. Yeah, and I, I've thought about that too a lot recently. Just, you know, what is love exactly? And, you know, my definition of it may differ from yours, may differ from your girlfriends, may differ from my cousins or my friends or my moms or my sisters or your mom or, you know, like whoever. It's We all have different interpretations of what love is. Is there a common definition of it, you think? No way. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I forget the words exactly for the poem, but I think it's uh, something like uh, some, a poem I wrote that uh, how can the dictionary define love when it means something different to each one of us? And uh, I don't, like, I really believe that. Like, it doesn't, there is no definition. It is what it is to you. And no one can tell you that you don't love someone or something because only you feel that. Yeah, I don't want to argue what it means, but I've thought a lot recently about is love a feeling or is it more of a quality, like a quality of the type of relationship that you have with someone? Like, you know how you'll hear people say, well, they're in a loving relationship. But you could yeah. be in a loving relationship with a friend. You could be in it with a family member. You could be in it with a significant other. Do you think there's any credence to my interpretation here that love is more quality than feeling? No, I definitely think so. I also think it transcends relationships or if people are, I mean, there's dead people that you love, you know? Your mother, your grandmother, your brother, your sister, your girlfriend, your wife passes away that your love for them doesn't stop it, it's just something that is it, it is i definitely understand that i definitely think that it's tough to put into words and i think poetry kind of helps you 
put those pieces of your puzzle, your definition of love together in a way, you know, through other people's interpretations and metaphors and analogies and and, and, and just different ways of, of viewing it and, and conveying it to, to people. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. There's just, to me, it's, it's, it's what, whatever you feel it is. Speaking of putting it into words or how it might not be able to put it into words, but let's try here. I picked out my favorite poem from your book, okay. and it's on page 120, and it goes a little something like this. Your tie-dyed mind understood the colors of mine, and I like the colorful aspect of it, you know, just kind of the imagery that it conveys. Tie-dyed mind, it's very psychedelic, and it's... Very, very hippie-ish. Very, very mind, hippie-ish, I mean, definitely. Know, I love Woodstock and Woodstock culture, Woodstock music we visited my, me and my family we go on a vacation every year we call it family vacation there's 10 11 12 of us that go and we'll rent a van or a big sprinter or something and uh we'll drive somewhere we went out to woodstock one year and went to the museum there and stuff and yeah i've always been fascinated i wouldn't wear a tie-dyed shirt but i totally think they look cool and old pictures and movies and stuff of hippies and oh you know. i i totally rock one right now for sure <laughs> pretty sure my dad would have one and he's not a hippie but he just has bad fashion sense (laughs) (laughs) i I, you know i think that's a dad thing yeah (laughs) i like this poem because it it has a little bit of crazy to it as well you know like a little love is love is fucking crazy sometimes and if you can find a, a crazy mind that that matches your kind of crazy like that's love i think especially if you can tolerate it right it's exactly I mean, me and my girlfriend, we get along so well, I think, because she just learned to tolerate my crazy. And if I had, uh, I was with someone that was also crazy, we would clash all the time. And uh, yeah, you got to find that balance. Yeah, that's that's totally cool, man. Do you have a favorite poem from your book here? Well, when you, when you, the first one I thought of when you said it, um, which is one of my favorite, and I actually wrote it a couple years ago on Valentine's Day for her, and it was, uh, love is finding a soul more comfortable than your own. And I always tell her, uh, and definitely a good way, that kind of being with her is kind of like being alone, if that makes sense. Like, I can just Mm. be myself. I'm totally comfortable. It's like I'm sitting on the couch completely alone. You know, like those times when you like dance in your room, no one's watching type moments. I don't mind having in front of her. And that was the best way I could describe that to her where, yeah, she just being in her presence is comfortable. That's what love is to me. It's just it's being yourself. It's being comfortable with who you are, with who they are and around them. And yeah, that was the first one that came to mind for me when we when we started talking about that. Hey man, I wrote a poem myself in honor of your appearance on my show here. And it's I love uh it. it's a one, two, three, four, five. It's eight lines, all right? And I'm gonna read it to you right now, okay? Perfect. Alright, so check this out. Microphone is lit, wouldn't you know it? Talking cannabis in love with the high poet. Society, quiet please. Listen to that silver tongue, fill up them iron lungs, puff on this flower like bumblebees. Or puff on this power on your knees. <laughs> I love it. And I love that you incorporated uh, the iron, lo- the silver tongue and iron lungs. <laughs> that was actually uh, something in the back of the book. Uh, lost uh, uh, the editors and the publishers put in there something at, at, at the end that they thought was awesome. Because it's uh, just a little motto I have on my Instagram and on my website. Um, And they saw it and they loved it. So they they put it in the back of the book and I love that you used it. Yeah, man. I saw it on your your Instagram and your website too. And I was like, that's a cool little phrase or saying or motto or whatever. Did you come up with that? Yeah, it was uh, something. I mean, iron lungs and silver tongue obviously isn't what I didn't come up with them. You know, it's just American idioms in there. And uh, yeah, iron lungs is definitely a Wu-Tang reference uh, method man. (laughs) <laughs> I don't For know sure. if you are, if you like Tupac, you probably like Wu Tang too. <laughs> <laughs> you're, hey, you're speaking my language here, man. For sure. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about with the Method Man, Iron Lungs. I have to give him credit. Like I said, being a stoner, I always said me and my friends would always say, as someone that could, I guess, smoke a lot or 
likes to smoke weed and a silver tongue is obviously a poet or someone that can write well so i can kind of combine the two i thought it perfectly fit what i was going for well i had a bumblebees reference in my poem i just read now i had killer bees and i wrote this like five minutes before we got on the call here but hey you can always edit yeah <laughs> that's that's true wrong. i always tell people it's, it's you true. can change it a hundred times there's nothing wrong with going back over and over you think something else is better? And I, I think after this conversation, Killer Bees is perfect. I had the Wu-Tang reference in there. I had Killer Bees, but I just changed it because I was like, uh, who the hell is going to know what Killer Bees are besides me? But uh, yeah, Wu- Wu-Tang forever. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that the best sign I want to have it in my house, I don't think my girlfriend will let me, though, is how can hip-hop be dead if Wu-Tang is forever? Hey, hey. I like that, man. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. That's totally cool. <laughs> That's a good note to at least sort of wrap up on because we started talking about Tupac. Here we're back around to Wu-Tang and I like hip hop. I like getting high and writing and (laughs) and reading as well. So remind people where they can keep up with you and your work. Definitely on Instagram is my main stuff. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Tumblr, uh, highpoetsociety.com. It will help you get some of my merchandise, my uh, signed poems, my anti poems. Um, it'll also redirect you to uh, where you can get the book and sign books. That's the only place that uh, you can get the signed books. And yeah, but most of the new stuff and the up and coming events and giveaways that I'm doing are on uh, Instagram. So you can definitely check it out there. Awesome. Brian Abbott at High Poet Society. High Poet Society, the book in stores now, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, com, as you said. Dude, thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It was fun chatting with you, and uh, love to do it absolutely. again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I I definitely am a fan of the website and stuff now, and I'll be uh, checking you out long past this interview is posted and everything. And uh, thanks for having me. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to the high poet Brian Abbott. Links to his website and social media profiles are in the show notes as is a link to his book on Amazon. My favorite bit from that chat that I was thinking about afterwards was this idea that everyone expresses emotions differently, and some people don't know how to put their emotions into words, which is fine. We're not all wordsmiths, and we're not all comfortable saying certain things out loud. And that's where something like art comes in. I mean, how many of you have shared a piece of art with someone, whether it's a poem or a song or a clip from a movie you like, and the words in those pieces, the sentiment in them, reflect exactly how you feel about that person at that moment. And there's nothing actually said about it between the two people. You don't share it with them and say, hey, this is how I feel. You don't have to, because it's understood. It's an unspoken declaration of your emotional state in that given moment, and it helps contextualize aspects of your relationship you may not otherwise know how to properly articulate. That was the beauty of the mixtape, a collection of songs that not only hit you in all your feel spots, but a collection of songs you know would hit your S.O. and all their feel spots. And those of you listening who weren't around when we were recording songs off the radio to a cassette or burning CDs full of illegally downloaded MP3s from Napster or LimeWire, you'll never understand the feeling of your crush handing you a cassette or a CD knowing that they put hours into picking just the right songs, just the right order, just the right mix to properly express themselves to you. I think the same can be said for a handwritten note. And you know, personally, I love doing that because it shows real effort. I'm not disparaging those of you who may have bought or received flowers or chocolate or jewelry for Valentine's Day or anniversaries or whatever, but to be honest, there's little effort involved in that. What sentiment does that really express? Maybe I'm cynical, maybe I just long for simpler times when I was roaming high school hallways and a note would pass from her hand to mine. Maybe it's nostalgia. Or maybe it's just the fact that we've forgotten how to be uniquely romantic. That's the kind of sexy we need to bring back. Some real, intimate romance that's unique to you and your boo. We all deserve that sort of effort. And if you're not getting that, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And I apologize. I just felt like I wanted to keep up with the hip-hop theme that Brian and I established. But one question is still lingering, and it's this. What is love to you? And the more I think about it, the more I wade through my own emotions, and the more I listen to and observe others, 
the more it seems none of us really know what love is. We think about it in different ways, we describe it in different terms. Really, we're all just guessing. And you know what? That's okay. Anyway, that does it for this one. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the chat. Subscribe to and rate the show on iTunes or wherever you're streaming from. You've been listening to O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority, and letting you know that it's so good to see you. Tell me how you've been. Why are you still living in the same day? Please rewind this cassette.